Today's screening, presented on a 35 millimeter print courtesy Janice Films, is part of our series In the Realm of Oshima, the best of Japanese master Nagisa Oshima, programmed by TIFF Cinematech senior programmer James Quant. This select retrospective confirms the boundary-pushing radical status as perhaps the greatest director of post-war Japanese cinema. It runs here at TIFF Cinematech until December 7th. For tickets and again information on the series, you can visit tiff.net slash Oshima. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's special guest. So back in the summer, I was looking for a speaker to contextualize this film, which is perhaps Oshima's most recognizable. I knew I needed someone steeped in all things pop culture and film, who was a font of music knowledge, and who could reflect on the cinematic paths of superstars David Bowie and Richu Sakamoto, and their momentous pairing in this very gripping World War II drama. I turned to Kieran Grant. And Kieran, ever the modest colleague, recommended literally three other music critics instead. He said he couldn't possibly do it, but all the while I knew he was mentally preparing a slide deck and a playlist. So once I came back to him and said, look, all these other music critics think you would do a spectacular job, he finally agreed because he realized what we all knew. Who better to trace the parallels between Bowie and Sakamoto than a man who spoke to Bowie on the phone many, many years ago? This is true. So, about Kieran. Kieran Grant joined TIFF in 2011 and currently oversees the organization's print and online output as its editor-in-chief in its brand and media division. He was previously film editor for the Toronto Alt Weekly I. Do you guys remember that? RIP, yeah? And he wrote about music for the better part of two decades. He is also the founding member of the pseudo-legendary, semi-dormant post-punk band, The Two Koreas. Please join me in welcoming Kieran, who's request, requested also a musical introduction, so stay tuned. Um, I apologize in advance, I, I, I can't top that. Uh, but to get used to that melody, you'll be hearing more of it in the next few hours. Um, many of you will recognize both it and the man performing that fairly recent live version with his piano trio. It is the haunting main theme from the film you're here to see today. Nagisa Oshima's Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, or as per its Japanese title you see behind me, Merry Christmas on the Battlefield. Uh, now that elegant musician at the keyboard is not only the soundtrack's composer, uh, but also the film's co-star, Ryoichi Sakamoto. It may be slightly difficult to reconcile that gently smiling 60-something musician with Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence's harsh, conflicted young POW camp commandant, Captain Yanoi. In fact, you will see in this film how much Ryoichi Sakamoto invested in his first ever acting exper experience. Uh, he jumped in deep, already aware that he was going to score the film, but determined to rise to the unexpected other job presented to him by Oshima. That was to star opposite David Bowie. Not unlike Bowie, Sakamoto was in his own right an art rock pioneer of international renown. Certainly in Japan, by the time of the film's release, he was as big a pop star as David Bowie. When Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence premiered at Cannes in May of 1983, its two lead musicians turned actors were each at a commercial apex and at resp respective artistic crossroads. Um, mind you, for Bowie, 1983 marked probably the sixth or seventh crossroads and certainly not his last, but both were embarking on the biggest phase of their careers sales-wise and also uh, significant artistic transitions. This makes their essential involvement in Oshima's first English language production that much more profound. I don't say this as a mere platitude. It's actually amazing that either of them had time, uh, and surely neither was about to say no to Oshima. Bowie's stop-start career sideline as a film actor had, in under a decade at this point, yielded unexpected supernovas, such as The Man Who Fell to Earth by Nicholas Rogue, and avoidable bombs, such as Just a Gigolo. Sakamoto had no ambitions to be an actor prior to Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, and he seemed reluctant at the invitation. All it reportedly took, uh, Oshima was seeing a uh, photograph of Sakamoto, um, who at the time was riding high along with his band uh, Yellow Magic Orchestra, aka YMO, the innovative electropop group who shortly after their 1978 formation had managed to become Jap Japan's uh, top selling band. Costumes and theatrics, sometimes satire, were a part uh, of a performance element for, for YMO. Uh, Oshima was struck by Sakamoto's androgynous good looks, uh, and, whereas Sakamoto apparently was more interested in Oshima's uh, 
plans for the film's music during his very first meeting with the director. Some versions of the story have it that Sakamoto only agreed to play Yanoi on the condition that he get to write the score. Either way, Oshimo was determined to stunt cast this rock star and non-actor. He had already cast another crossover performer from the rock world for the very important role of New Zealand Army officer Major Jack Selliers. And that was David Bowie who had uh, actually first caught the director's eye when he appeared in a Japanese gin commercial. It's called Crystal Gin. It's on YouTube. You can look it up. Bowie really clinched the role uh, as early as 1980 when Oshima saw him on Broadway playing John Merrick in The Elephant Man. He said he knew immediately that Bowie was Sellers. He, he described him as having an inner spirit that was indestructible. And that is what Mr. Mer Merry, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence is all about, the inner human that war cannot touch. Oshima later said that he liked the effect these novice screen actors had on an ensemble cast, noting that when confronted by non-professional actors, the professionals become more honest and truthful in their performances. It's worth noting that Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence also featured another bit of proverbial stunt casting. That was uh, the Japanese comedian and actor Takeshi Kitano, who uh, had his first dramatic role uh, as the brutal Sergeant Hara in this film. Bowie, uh, for his part, he jumped at the chance to work with Oshima, uh, whose fearless work he admired greatly. He said, I pretty much went for it without knowing what the story was about. Uh, he called it a privilege to work with Oshima. Uh, after signing on early 1980, well before the production was coming together, Bowie only then read the 1963 novel from which the film was sourced, uh, The Seed and the, and the Sower by Lawrence Vanderpost, and the script by Paul Myersberg, who also, also actually written The Man Who Fell to Earth. Uh, the singer did note that he was approaching burnout when it was finally time to head to the South Pacific to start Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, in the late summer of 1982. He just wrapped Tony Scott's The Hunger, uh, and the, that ended up coming out back to back with Oshima's film. And the last thing I wanted to do was make a, a movie, Bowie said at the time. Um, but as we'll see, he was operating in characteristic nonstop creative fashion and was not about to slow down for a while yet. Now, uh, Bowie's arrival on the Polynesian island of Rarotonga in the Cook Islands um, forged a relatively brief collaboration but enduring connection with this musician-turned-actor counterpart, Ryuichi Sakamoto. It's tempting to draw comparisons between the two of, of these, these two artists, uh, you know, case in point. Uh, really, their personas and career arcs were very different. Bowie was born in January of 1947, exactly five years to the month older than Sakamoto. That's deceptive given how much longer Bowie had been on the scene. Uh, Sakamoto was a classically trained pianist who'd spent most of the 70s studying musical composition and ethnomusicology and doing session work. His own um, 1978 uh, debut solo album, Thousand Knives of Ryoichi Sakamoto, actually predated Yellow Magic Orchestra's first release by a month. So this too was a very busy man. So yes, okay, there are similarities too and parallels to be found musically between Thousand Knives and notably Bowie's uh, 1976 album, Low. One can only imagine uh, the kinds of conversations that these two uh, may have had about music. They forged a friendship on set. In Sakamoto's words, when reflecting back on the experience 30 years later, he described Bowie as a very nice and straightforward guy and said they hung out every night because there was nothing else to do. And yet Sakamoto says he didn't consult Bowie about the score. He said he hadn't started working on it yet. He was totally concentrated on acting. And he also just hesitated to ask David to work on the music uh, at the time because he seemed so focused on acting too. He then later described that as being quite weird and didn't understand why he didn't pursue the opportunity. But uh, I think the, the, the fruits of that are, I think, bear out in, in, in the film. Um, certainly, uh, Bowie had been paying attention to Yellow Magic Orchestra, the band that put Sakamoto on the map internationally. Though Sakamoto went on to great renown as a composer, YMO remains his most famous contribution to the broader spectrum of pop music. Alongside Kraftwerk, the group arguably completed the musical template for technopop. They parodied Orientalist cliches, Western notions about Eastern culture, uh, while kind of picking up on Giorgio Moroder's cues and offering Eurodisco a sort of futuristic Asian rejoinder. Here's a, here's a little sampling of uh, a very early YMO. The, uh, they also sort of lovingly embraced Eastern melody and American funk. During a regular tour of the United States in 1980, they appeared on Soul Train with their version of Archie Bell and the Drell's 1968 R&B classic, Tighten Up. And on that television uh, appearance, they also played their song Firecracker, which was later sampled quite widely in hip hop uh, by Africa Bombata, among others. And their relationship with early hip hop was reciprocal by 1983's excellent album, BGM, which stands for background music. They were flirting with rap. Um, 
And the same album also included a single called Q, which was well ahead of the curve by British synth pop standards. So really YMO were very eclectic and extremely accomplished and knew exactly what they were doing at every step. Sakamoto was a neophyte when it came to acting, and he had mixed feelings about it, not David Bowie. While Sakamoto could be described as working in character and performance with YMO, Bowie had experience not just on the stage from his training with, uh, in mime with Lindsay Kemp in the late 60s and his, his work on The Elephant Man, but also uh, a kind of actorly approach to rock performance, which dated back to his earliest uh, solo perf performances. So you'll obviously recognize that as an early version of Space Oddity there. Um, that was a promo film that was put together in early 1969 using uh, some older tracks from his 1967 uh, self-titled debut and also some new songs like Space Oddity. Um, not enough mime in that, though. I would have liked to have seen more mime. Uh, and yes, that was, a, that was a teaser for a television uh, broadcast of that film, which saw the light of day years after it was made. Um, so basically you've got like Bowie's hit, first hit records are 18 months to three years away, Man Who Sold the World, Hunky Dory. He was still finding his feet as a musician and performer. Potential acting was still on the slate for him. In 1968, he'd cut his hair short for this iconic moment you're about to see. Now watch the area behind the bar around uh, five or six seconds in. Just uh, watch carefully. This is from The Virgin Soldiers, a 1969 film. Did anyone see him? Did, um, <laughs> I think that's, a, that's, probably, that's not really a walk-on, it's more of a roll-off. Uh, so that was his feature film debut, uh, uncredited. Oh yeah, there he is with his haircut. So it, it's um, amazing to think that within four years he'd created his first several musical alter egos, Ziggy Stardust, and he was already blurring the line between that character and, and, and real life in D.A. Pennybacker's documentary Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars from 1973. Now, if Oshima had been moved by what he saw as Bowie's inner strength, Nicholas Rogue was drawn to the singer's much vaunted otherworldliness when he cast him as the lead in 1976's The Man Who Fell to Earth. Again, this was a case of the non-actor allegedly not acting, though Bowie, even in the difficult state he was in at the time, took the assignment very seriously. Here's a, a clip of him actually talking about his work on the film. So yeah, there you go. Confusion aside, it really did jumpstart uh, his next musical phase. Um, and he, he entered into, after Station to Station, of course, starting with Lowe, he entered into his classic uh, Berlin trilogy, where it's widely believed that he pretty much kind of got things together, too. You can see things were a little bit muddled when he was making The Man Who Fell to Earth and just afterward. Um, but uh, it's, it's actually interesting to note that somewhere in there, uh, he, all, there was also Just a Gigolo. That was a film Bowie starred in mainly because he wanted to work with its director, the great actor David Hemmings. Also in the cast was Kim Novak. Bowie's most famous quote about the experience was that it was his 32 Elvis Presley films rolled into one. Um, so it was, yeah, an unmitigated disaster, I believe, but uh, it probably you'd think be put in, uh, enough to put him off of acting. Uh, but it wasn't. Uh, where he turned next was uh, both of him and Sakamoto went into uh, very sort of pr productive and prolific phases. Bowie was rounding out his Berlin trilogy with 1979's Lodger and uh, his commercial comeback, 1980's Scary Monsters. And almost concurrently, um, he uh, took, a, took on that very important uh, acting follow-up to Just a Gigolo uh, by performing in uh, the touring and Broadway version of... Uh, uh, the Elephant Man in the second half of 1980. And this is the film that, um, well, you'll see. I said film, it's actually obviously stage. Uh, but um, that is, of course, the performance that led to him being cast by Oshima. Uh, and yet, Bowie still had another film role in the way. Uh, he had uh, The Hunger. With um, Catherine Deneuve and Susan Sarandon. It was straight from that set uh, that was directed by Tony Scott, by the way. Um, it was straight from that set to the set of Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, uh, which led Bowie to re reflect later that he was, he was feeling like, shit, I'm exhausted, I don't want to do this. But uh, he couldn't have stayed weary for long. In fact, he was fascinated by the differences in working with, with Oshima. He felt the experience was more freeform, more like it had been with Nicholas Rogue, Whereas David Hemmings and Tony Scott were, in Bowie's words, more uh, kind of dealing with production and, 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 and money. Yes, the, uh, he also noticed, uh, noted uh, deliberate differences in Oshima's approach with the British and Australian actors versus the Japanese actors. 
things were loose and neorealistic with Western actors pulling lines from Paul Myersberg's script, improvising a little, and rolling with very little warning. Uh, whereas the uh, Japanese actors, there was there was much more detailed direction and stylized performances. And this created a sense of divide, uh, Bowie noted, between the prisoners and the captors in the film. The scenes were usually done in the first or second take. Oshima uh, also shot in sequence, editing in camera, as they say, uh, sending the film off to Tokyo without even ever viewing Daily Rushes whatsoever. And Bowie was delighted by what he called this quite bizarre and frightening approach. And the entire film was shot within a month, and he marveled that Oshima completed a rough edit in four days upon returning to Japan. I think he may have taken a page out of Oshima's book too, because Bowie then swiftly flew to New York, teamed up with co-producer Niall Rogers, and proceeded to record Let's Dance in a month between December 1982 and January 83. So by the time Oshima's film debuted at Cannes, Bowie had already released a number one hit off of that album. Now here's a glimpse of how most of the world was seeing David Bowie on television every day, uh, just as Mr. Lawrence got its uh, wider theatrical release. Meanwhile, um, Ryuichi Sakamoto and Yellow Magic Orchestra were walking sort of two sides of the musical street at once. Uh, they'd gone from wearing masks and uniforms, kind of think Kraftwerk and Devo, uh, and sampling Martin Denny records and LED video games. And I do mean sampling, and as, as caught on later in the 80s, they were doing it very early, if not first. Um, they began to embrace their own pop star glamour, morphing into a kind of early 80s prototype boy band, uh, which may be more accurately described as a lampoon of, of, of such a thing, especially considering that the core trio were all over 30 years old by 1983. Uh, so in the process, uh, YMO may have invented modern J-pop as, as we know it. YMO uh, released um, two studio albums and, uh, and then uh, staged a major farewell concert at Tokyo's Budokan, which yielded a concert film called Propaganda and a live album after service. It was a, a pretty big deal at the time, uh, as you can see from the way it's staged, and it certainly, uh, I would say, rivals what Bowie was doing on a serious Moonlight tour. Sakamoto and his bandmates ceased operations as Yellow Magic Orchestra in 1984, uh, reuniting periodically over the ensuing decades. They preferred to use the expression spreading out instead of breaking up. But the ever prolific uh, Sakamoto I'm just going to, let's just skip to the next one. I'm conscious of time here. The ever pro prolific Sakamoto enjoyed a successful career, uh, moving gradually more and more toward experimental, experimental music by the 2000s. Charged by his experience scoring Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which won him the BAFTA for best film music, he returned in earnest to composition. As for acting, well, he, um, claimed that he thought his performance in Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence was terrible. I disagree, but uh, only one more significant acting gig followed in 1987, and that was a mid-sized role in Bernardo Bertolucci's The Last Emperor, which Sakamoto also scored along with David Byrne and the Chinese composer Kong Su. They won uh, the Oscar for that, for Best Original Score. They also won a Golden Globe and an, a Grammy. More soundtracks and accolades followed, almost like clockwork, Bertolucci's The Sheltering Sky, Little Buddha, uh, Inuit II's Babel, uh, and The Revenant, which was nominated for a Golden Globe. And meanwhile, Bowie continued with some, I, wouldn't, I guess we saw a little more than dabbling in acting. Here you see him as Pontius Pilate in The Last Temptation of Christ, Jareth, the Goblin King in uh, Labyrinth, which I'm sure people remember fondly, and uh, also uh, Nikolai Tesla in um, Christopher Nolan's The Prestige in 2006. That was his last acting role, and it was a very good one. So, in fact, it was at the uh, Golden Globe ceremony on January 10th, 2016, uh, that uh, Sakamoto learned his old friend and co-star, David Bowie, had died that day at uh, age 69. Sakamoto himself was in recovery from throat cancer at the time, uh, and like many of their colleagues, he didn't know that Bowie was gravely ill. He uh, lamented in an interview last year with The Guardian that he hadn't reconnected with David Bowie while the two were virtually neighbors in New York City in recent years. It's tempting to read into the singular nature of their on-screen one-off as the impetus for this, but really it was probably a case of two very focused, rather shy and deceptively earnest men who wanted to stay out of each other's very perfect hair. But one can imagine what might have been uh, and what some of those conversations were like back on the Cook Islands back in the summer of 1982. Please enjoy this beautiful underrated war film uh, and this unique event of acting and creative energy. 
Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to play myself off with the uh, official pop music video that came out with Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence.